Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Drianski, and I'm the CEO and co-founder at uh, Remedo Labs, um, a spin-off from the Poznan University of Technology in Poland, focusing on open run and developing XApps and Arabs. And um, today we'll have a panel session uh, with presentations and then later on a panel discussion. So let me uh, start with a little bit of introduction and uh, setting up a background. So um, we are going to speak about Open Run and uh, 6G. Um, so a few words about Open Run, few words about 6G, and then how they are brought together. Um, so from one side, we have um, currently the current uh, networks are pretty complex. They are uh, resulting in the so-called heterogeneous networks, which is a big challenge for radio resource management and optimization in the networks. Uh, we have uh, multi-rad networks with multiple radio access technologies, including um, LTE and new radio brought into non-standalone version or a standalone version with multiple features, multiple different um, frequency bands, TDD and FDD, carrier aggregation, dual connectivity, um, aggregation with Wi-Fi, also unlicensed spectrum being in place. So all that brings um, a huge complexity in how we manage the networks, how we uh, efficiently um, uh, use the energy, how if we can optimize the energy, if we can uh, deliver the, the proper performance to the networks, that's um, a huge challenge uh, in today's networks. Um, on one side, um, uh, we have open run concept, which is um, currently being discussed in um, telecom infra projects and in Oran Alliance and multiple other bodies, which is basically uh, bringing and splitting the traditional run into multiple entities into multiple um, base station components. Um, so we have four major uh, items or four major concepts regarding the open run. First of all, we disaggregate the traditional base station into multiple entities like central unit, distributed unit, radio unit. Um, then we have in between them the open interfaces and those are standardized. This is uh, what is the main role of uh, Oran Alliance. So we have the open front hall. Um, the E2 and A1 interface, uh, those open interfaces allowing for multi-vendor um, deployments. Uh, the third aspect is the coupling hardware from software, so that's virtualization, um, and that's already started with VRAN, but now together with disaggregation that gets into the open run. And the, finally, the most important aspect from my side is to have the intelligence uh, taken out of the actual base station, that is RAN Intelligent Controller, the RIC, in multiple um, variations, um, the non-real-time rig and near-real-time rig, but the most important aspect is to bring the native intelligence through the AI and machine learning into the actual network to get uh, them exposed and to be able to control them regarding uh, the challenges that we just shown in a sec um, regarding the, the network, the private mobile networks and other uh, aspects. Of course, this is not only advantages uh, coming up with the open run. Uh, so first of all, we get the vendor lock-in avoidance with multiple players coming into, pl into place, new players, reducing CapEx because of that as well, um, getting the flexibility. So once we have the virtual networks and we can put uh, the, the different parts of the base stations when they are needed and how they are needed, this is also coming up into challenges and currently there is a, a sort of a reality check for open run uh, after those kind of years of, of technology development. So um, one of the most important aspects is interoperability and integration and this will be touched by one of our speakers that I will introduce in a sec. Uh, how once we disaggregate all those elements then we need to put them together. Um, another one is uh, security that is uh, being currently also discussed widely in the industry where we basically uh, need to handle the fact that we have uh, also open source in, in that area. If uh, we have multiple new players, if we have uh, multiple players um, in, into uh, the ecosystem, uh, also the performance, if the performance of those um, disaggregated and then aggregated or integrated networks will deliver the performance it needs, and also the inertia that comes also with the technology maturity. So from the decision of having open run through the um, standard development, then to the implementation, and then finally to the actual deployment, 
there is a long path, um, specifically speaking about within the operator's domain, when the decision making is taking time. And of course, um, the operators need to also learn those new um, aspects and how to manage all those elements. Um, so that was open run, a little bit of a background. And then we have on the other end, the 6G. So some time ago, we already, there was a question if 6G is needed at all, if it will happen or not. Uh, but ultimately, as we can see, it's already happening um, and we have multiple different um, bodies. We have multiple different uh, research projects, uh, universities, um, also uh, the, on the different countries. Also, the companies are already working with 6G. So it's already a fact. The question is what will be part of that and when it will happen. So if we can have a look at the sort of um, a tentative guess uh, timeline from different perspectives coming up from the research that already started in 2020, we had them um, early research already there. Um, then ITU will most likely uh, provide soon the requirements for IMT uh, 2030. And then the standardization will follow with um, pro possibly release uh, 21 uh, providing the 6G standardization um, around uh, 2027, 2028, uh, with the first commercial deployment around 2030. So pretty similar to what we already know from the from the past. The, the important aspect is that currently we are also part of the release 18 timeframe with 5G advanced. So possibly there will be something like 5G advanced pro to complement what we had uh, in LTE. Uh, speaking about 6G, there are, of course, multiple different use cases and technologies that are already on the table and discussed with different standardization bodies. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of all. I've just selected a couple of them. The One of the one that is uh, repeated over and over, that's uh, configurable intelligent surfaces, so RESIS. But we also have in multiple places um, seen uh, the open run as part of that and AI native design. As we know, with 5G, uh, the situation is slightly different. Uh, open run and AI native uh, and AI design or AI functionality has been brought once the 5G uh, was in place. Now with 6G, there is a possibility that we'll have them as a native uh, design. The question and also for the panel discussion today, we will have if uh, AI and open run brought together will be part of 6G as a native uh, design or should they uh, be a separate track? So that will be one of the interesting aspects to be uh, seen. Also, we will discuss what's the research topics um, coming up. Uh, finally, we um, had something about open run and something about uh, 6G. Uh, how this is matched together. So currently, uh, since um, since June 2022, um, Oran Alliance, the main standardization body for uh, Open Run, uh, specifying the the interfaces and entities, and also testing um, those um, solutions within Plugfest, has um, set up a new uh, focus group, special focus group, which is Oran Next Generation Research Group. And that focus uh, is focus of that group is the research of open run towards 6G and future network standards. So that's actually there where the operators, vendors, research institutions and academics are now working towards getting um, open run uh, concepts into 6G uh, to get it started there. So with that, I'd like to conclude that um, initial background setup that we will build upon the panel, uh, and I would like also to, to speak about a little bit about the topics that we are going to cover today. Um, so we'll start with what's currently there, uh, what are the current state of deployments and, and um, uh, trials within open run networks. Um, then the second topic that will be also touched by one of our speakers is the applicability of the open run networks in the vertical industries of private network. Um, and then we will also speak about open run within 6G. So what are the related research topics? And of course, then if uh, open run fits into 6G at all. Um, open run integration challenges and maturity, that's one of the major challenge and will be also handled by one of our speakers. And then finally, as we know, we have um, open run uh, software community, we have ONF, we have um, Eurecom and open air interface, we have um, powder project in the States. Uh, so how open source also fits into open run networks. 
And with that, uh, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's presentations. So we will start with Rudiger Kunze, uh, Head of Research uh, of Standardization Process Services at Deutsche Telekom, who will speak about the last topic that I mentioned. So open run ecosystem within uh, the open source within open run. And then we will have Mats Eriksson followed up um, the CEO uh, of Agriculture Labs and lead business developer at Theatre Every with uh, Oran integration challenges now and also what he can expect in the future. Uh, later, we will turn on to more academic view and the research topics, which is um, Adrian Kliks from Poznan University of Technology and CTO at Remedo Lab speaking about intelligent conflict mitigation automation and the open run networks and then finally we will have um, simon prior and research and innovation director at acceleran who will speak about open run uh, private within private networks and vertical industries currently and what we can expect in uh, 6g research so that is all from my side at this point later after those uh, talks we will have um, a, discussion uh, with all the panelists today. So without further ado, let me now turn on um, to Rudiger, who will start to uh, with his presentation on open run ecosystem developed by open source communities. So Rudiger, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Marcin. And uh, let me start my slides. Um, I hope you can see it uh, now. So good morning. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, and um, yeah, welcome uh, to my talk about um, how open source communities can uh, leverage uh, the development or the, the creation of, of new ecosystems, um, especially in the area of, of disaggregated um, access uh, products. And uh, before I dive into uh, the topic in detail, I would like to stress a bit um, the term business ecosystem. So, and, and we hear, hear uh, that term quite often um, in presentations, in speeches. So we need a, a sustainable, um, resilient ecosystem and such kind of things. Uh, but I think we, we may mix here things up. Um, there is a clear differentiation between supply chain, the classic supply chain, and how an ecosystem looks like. And um, examples for supply chains uh, you see quite often because um, this is a um, very common approach, uh, how to produce products, uh, not only in telco, even in automotive industry. So there are a lot of uh, manufacturers using this kind of supply chain approach today. And the supply chain is, is quite easy to, to, to explain. Uh, you have a lot of specifications, even standards, uh, that you hand over to a third party. And this kind of party is manufacturing parts of your product exactly as you described it in the specifications. And you assemble things at an assembly site, and at the end, you, you, you uh, get a, a high quality product. Um, <clears throat> that's for sure. A business ecosystem works completely different uh, compared to a supply chain. Within a diff, uh, in, in a business ecosystem, you have a number of loosely coupled partners working together, yeah, having an alignment on, on, first of all, on a value proposition that you need for, for every product that's clear. But the, these kind of companies uh, stand behind a shared value proposition. And there is an orchestration company. So this is completely a different approach compared to, to supply chain. You have an orchestrator who ensures that alignment over the entire product development uh, life cycle, right? And, and this kind of company uh, um, ensures as well uh, that you create a win-win situation for all the partners participating in that ecosystem. And uh, ecosystem means as well co-creation and co-innovation. And that we, um, um, needs um, a trust relationship as well between the partners in that ecosystem. <clears throat> so why do I stress that term uh, so much? Because if we, and I have to go on the next slide, 
If we talk about disaggregation, and Marcin mentioned at the beginning a lot of uh, um, benefits and as well uh, challenges uh, with regards to, to disaggregated products, then we need um, uh, to, to look, uh, and then the, the ecosystem approach fits perfectly to this disaggregated um, access products. And uh, I would like to, to um, um, repeat um, why we are using um, or why we are going towards uh, disaggregated solutions. So that's not to, to annoy the classic suppliers, the traditional ones. So that's why we react or we have to react on, on changes, on huge changes uh, with regards to our business. <clears throat> this includes as well geopolitical changes. And what geopolitical uh, impact means, you see every day uh, nowadays in the news, right? And this this includes as well changes on our supplier landscape. Yeah? There is a further consolidation, and Marcin mentioned it at the beginning. We are talking about um, new ecosystems. Then we are talking about as well new suppliers, new companies coming up into that area and um, co-innovate and co-create things. <clears throat> For us as, as um, telco operator, Disaggregation means as well independence, right? Uh, with uh, with disaggregation, uh, give, this gives us a greater scope uh, with regards to decision making and action, and it enables competition as well. Um, software plays an important role as well. Um, with software, we are we we are enable differentiation, <clears throat> and therefore we need open interfaces and as well op uh, open APIs in that area. <clears throat> so, and uh, which role play communities here in that uh, area? Uh, so that's quite easy um, because um, communities as ONF um, took early concepts from research, brought it into a um, yeah more um, product related environment um, they picked up uh, the SDM approaches and uh, distributed uh, towards a, a bigger range of, of audience, so to say. So they um, distributed the knowledge coming from the research and transferred it into the companies. So that's that's one reason why uh, communities as ONF and others are so important. And we as Deutsche Telekom have recognized really the, the importance of the communities and they are helping us as well um, to um, adopt and learn a lot um, with regards to uh, this kind of open source development or software development uh, with regards to CI, CD chain uh, and so on and so on testing and this kind of things. Um, this is really a, a great stuff uh, um, that they provide to us and, and we can learn a lot. But communities have, uh, with regards to ecosystem development, uh, as well another role um, because of the entry barrier for new, um, new players. Um, <clears throat> communities are have a really low entry barrier. So if you compare it with FreeGPP, for example, <clears throat> if you are a new company, let's say with 15, 20 people developing a certain um, certain part of, of software, let's say X apps, uh, and you would like to, to create a bit more impact and bring in your ideas, co-innovate, so to say, and then you decide you, you go into a free GPP, forget it, right? Um, therefore, this kind of low entry barrier is really important um, and this drives really innovation brings in new companies, small players working together and communities as ONF <clears throat> giving the room for this kind of, of interworking and relationship building. But as well, um, other parts or other communities are important as well. So I'm, I'm focusing here a bit on, on ONF today because uh, I was involved in in my role in, in two projects, two important projects for us as DT. And I would like to go a little bit more in detail 
uh, with regards to that. <clears throat> so the first part is the fixed access part. So with our project access 4.0, we are driving really that disaggregated um, uh, disaggregation stuff uh, towards mass market rollout. So we're supporting Volta and Siba uh, into the community, but as well using parts of, of that um, solution within our disaggregated uh, fixed access products. <clears throat> On the left side, and that's where I dive a little bit more um, into is the um, as DRAN project that the ONF uh, was pushing and driving with a lot of uh, in operator interest and uh, input. And here we um, set up a trial um, mid of last year uh, in Berlin, um, where we fully um, demonstrated an end-to-end -end setup of an ORAN compliant solution. And I would like to, to jump a bit more in detail uh, with regards to that uh, trial setup. <clears throat> so here we worked, and, and this was really last year, um, September timeframe. This was a world premiere, to be honest. And uh, what we did here with 10 partners was really, really amazing. Um, due to Corona, we, we did that setup completely uh, remotely. So. No one of the vendors, uh, except someone from ONF, were on site. <clears throat> so we did. Uh, we took the equipment uh, and put it together, um, um, supported by the partners, but remotely. So we we started um, um, to use uh, Foxconn RUs. <clears throat> These are outdoor RUs. Um, we we have a backyard here at the Berlin location where we installed that stuff. Um, we are using um, from Redesis the DUCU equipment. On top, uh, we we are using uh, ONF's micro honors near real time rig, uh, providing uh, the SDKs towards uh, the X apps. Um, here we used uh, X apps from Airhop and Facebook and uh, Remedo as well. Um, and uh, we have as well here in that setup, I mentioned it's an end-to-end -end solution, um, 5G core, um, fully cloud native support here. Um, it can run on a hyperscaler cloud, can run on every public or private cloud um, based on Kubernetes. Um, and the end-to-end -end setup uh, we are demonstrated uh, was really a world premiere. Um, the focus here with that setup, and uh, here we had a lot of uh, discussions and support from the community as well, uh, was a focus on private 5G and enterprise use cases. <clears throat> and that's the, quite a difference uh, to some other open run or SD run projects that are running worldwide, even within DET. Here we have the focus clearly on enterprise use cases and private network. So with um, some lessons learned, um, um, I would like to, to go forward uh, within that presentations. Um, I mentioned the focus on, on private 5G and enterprise, and that's uh, really, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's really um, that's really important uh, to mention because um, there is a lot of uh, a high ambition level with regards to mobile broadband, and and we said it's quite easier to start um, in the area of private 5G, um, and um, this reduces complexity. Uh, this reduces as well the expectation uh, level on on possible customer side. So it's much easier to go in, in, into that way and to collect and, and yeah, collect experiences, made experiences uh, in that area, and then step by step go ahead uh, and, and you do other things on top of that. Um, I mentioned the communities and uh, the collaboration between the 10 partners. Um, you, you can call it ecosystem, but uh, we are far away. 
uh, from from uh, making a product out of it. I'm coming uh, to to that uh, point later. But the community is is really uh, the ONF in that case is really a good good um, playground to set up things, to demonstrate things, to drive things to a certain level of of um, of um, readiness, uh, I can say, and to prove the concepts coming from Oran and from other standardization communities in that case. Um, <clears throat> APIs um, and interfaces, standardized interfaces, are really important as well um, if you run that ecosystem approach. Because in a disaggregated um, world or in, in, a, in, a, in a world where you put um, break out or, or break this kind of black box uh, silos towards smaller pieces, it's quite important having well spe specified and defined interfaces so that every partner uh, of the ecosystem uh, can work on, on his piece and that the interworking with the other components is uh, smooth and, and, and well going. <clears throat> so APIs are quite important. So and therefore it's, it's really uh, uh, important to work together with uh, communities as Aura and Alliance specifying these interfaces and APIs. So, um, and, and now I come to that, that point uh, I mentioned before, um, what we can achieve. Um, communities um, are a enabling function for this kind of ecosystems. But at the end, um, you won't reach um, that product scale uh, platform implementation base that, that you need to create an, a new product out of it. So therefore, you need more than this, this kind of, um, let's say, foundation. foundation. Um, but but with that foundation, you, 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 you reach a lot of things. Uh, you can demonstrate and show how an Oran specification um, will work. Um, because what, what we set up there is a so-called, you can call it a, a reference architecture, um, working end-to-end. -end. And with that um, tool landscape that the ONF built around that uh, together with the partners, uh, you can demonstrate much more. Um, it goes towards, uh, towards the direction of a product. Uh, it ensures interoperability and, and open innovation. And with the trial that we uh, set up here in Berlin, we can integrate new parties, um, interwork with uh, third parties, new X app developers uh, to demonstrate um, how their products and services are working. <clears throat> um, to leverage that on a product level, this kind of orchestration company that I mentioned at the beginning is needed, spending much more effort um, on uh, driving this towards uh, production. But the basement, um, and the foundation uh, can be can be done by communities or by approaches um, supported by open source communities. So, and this brings me to my last slide. Um, we are on a transformation journey as operators. So, I mentioned uh, why we do um, why we do uh, go towards uh, disaggregated approaches uh, within our um, product and service chain and um, how communities uh, can support this. So they are really enablers um, um, for new ecosystems, offering uh, this space, even the trust space, um, having uh, low entry barriers for new for new operators and come up with approaches and solutions beyond the status quo so um and this are really essential uh, parts if you transfer from a classic telco as dt is doing towards a software telco 
then communities are, are the right step that we need to transform our operational models as well. And that's from my side. Thanks a lot. Okay. So thanks, um, Rudiger, for your insights from the operator's perspective. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Mats from Tieto Every and Arctos Labs who will speak about the integration challenges. Thank you very much, Marcin, and uh, thanks for having the opportunity to uh, talk at this event. Uh, so I'm Matt Eriksson. I uh, am a lead business developer for radio at Tier 2 Every. Uh, so I will talk about integration challenges that we see now and, uh, and how we see them evolving into the future. Um, firstly, uh, a few words on tier to every we are a 24000 people uh, professional services company uh, with with people across the world in in uh, in Europe and in China and in, and in the US uh, we have some 2500 people uh, working with telecom and embedded uh, well kind of telecom R&D <clears throat> so our clients is is tier 1 vendors uh, it's open run vendors it's uh, it's operators. It's also we're working quite heavily with uh, silicon uh, suppliers, helping them with their reference architectures and and platforms to enable <coughs> to enable open run, uh, for example. Um, we're also working with uh, with cloud run kind of uh, proprietary virtualized run uh, approaches as well. Um, so. If, if we now talk about integration, uh, so what is integration really? Uh, well, to me, it's an R&D challenge, basically. And we can think about it as, and, and the reason for that is we can think about two different modes of integration. It's the top one in, on this slide where it's, where it's about modifying the things that you integrate until they work. Or it's more like, like a PC is today uh, we can connect things that, that will likely work. You know this will work uh, quite soon, right? Uh, and today, we're definitely seeing that the open-run integration is, is the modify until it works paradigm. Um, and and there, are, there are a couple of points that I would like to make. Uh, we, we're today very much talking about uh, this integration as integration of a G node B. Uh, whilst Iran is, is a network and we will see uh, and we will have kind of brownfields uh, and and we have the issue of the RIC, uh, the two RICs, uh, which are which which is on network level. Um, but then also I think the industry is very much focusing on interoperability, which is not the same thing as easy to integrate. And I will I will touch on that a little bit what I mean and why I think that the, it is important to keep those two things, to understand the difference between interoperability and easy to integrate. And, and some of that is, of course, related to the ability to, to do tailoring, to, to use cases and, and uh, uh, where do we see volumes and, and uh, of, of certain tailorings, etc. cetera. Um, so I had a, a colleague of mine that said, there is only construction and then there is reconstruction. Uh, this was an, an uh, ex-colleague from a from a big Nordic vendor. Um, so, if we now look in, in where are we in this evolution of of integration? And uh, I mean, we can we can what we can uh, view the the traditional system. And Marcin showed that this is just a different way of 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 describing that. Uh, and then, of course. We, we started to to try to virtualize things uh, started from core networks and then uh, kind of emerging into into RON and base stations as well uh, which br bring us a couple of new elements but uh, um, importantly uh, we now need to do what I call vertical integration the hardware software integration which has been proven to be quite difficult uh, as part of the NFV journey uh, and and Ron is probably the most difficult one. Uh, so and then uh, I think that as Rudiger mentioned, now we want to disaggregate this because we want to have 
a more flexible choice of, of vendors of the, of the different parts and and for that matter also for uh, the flexibility of being able to deploy a 5d network more uh, kind of uh, to achieve certain characteristics but then of course that brings us to horizontal integration the, these parts needs to go together they need to interwork together uh, and and this is uh, this is probably an area where we would like to have kind of out of the box interoperability and and that could probably be achieved to a certain extent. Uh, but then, of course, we also need uh, to be able to integrate the uh, the operational aspects, because if we now start to mix and match vendors, uh, they come with their own operational models. Uh, so now we need to, to be able to bring that back, uh, either to make it look like it used to do or or to make it look uh, the way we want it to, to look from an operational perspective. Um, then we're going into and 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 we're we're somewhere there, right? We're, uh, at the moment. Um, then the next step would be: Can we make these networks to be more autonomous? Uh, and th this is where the the RICs, the two different RIC layers, come into play. Uh, but it also brings us the issue of how do we integrate that automation? Uh, and I, I will touch on that, and Adrian will touch on that more later. Um, and then the final stage for me is, is when you start to understand that for some of these vertical use cases, uh, we actually have application components, which may be AI based for, for machine control in a, in a manufacturing setting or something that actually needs the same infrastructure, same type of infrastructure as the RON. So you might want to run those co-located on the same uh, hardware platform. And now we need to make sure that that works as well. Uh, so there is a certain integration there. Uh, but then, uh, last but not least, uh, as Marcin mentioned, uh, we need to make sure that this, this the result of this integration is secure enough. Uh, and this, this kind of follows us on all the way. Um, so these are, these are some of the integration aspects. And I, I will touch on, on some of them uh, in my following slides. Um, so if we start by the vertical integration, and, and as I said, RON is a very demanding application. Um, so we're seeing CPU-based um, open RON solutions, uh, kind of, but that's on the lower end of the performance. Um, so how, how do we now achieve a higher degree of performance and an energy efficiency, which is probably one of the most important aspects and, and challenges uh, right now in the industry. Um, well, of course, we can have this look aside uh, architecture, uh, which has its benefits of being f more flexible, uh, where, where you can have or not have an accelerator, uh, or you can have more of this inline architecture shown at the bottom. Um, the, a couple of points here, uh, open does not necessarily mean generic uh, and, and COTS could be very specialized hardware, but still it's disaggregated, it comes from different vendors. Um, and GPUs or, or FPGAs or those kind of things are, are examples of that. But then also, I mean, if we look out the window and see what, what where is the industry going in general, IT industry, they are going towards more specialized CPUs anyhow, uh, with with specialized instruction sets and, and those kind of things. So of course we see we see an evolution from kind of Moore's law anyhow, uh, that of course we need to harvest in this industry as well. Um, and having been in the industry for decades, baseband uh, and the lower layers of that has always been a very challenging programming uh, task uh, and and there is nothing new there as soon as you bring in accelerators or for that matter if you're programming baseband on a cpu you have to do it efficiently so it's so it's the same thing and, there, and there's differences between the different implementations we see uh, when it comes to uh, to efficiency uh, and and of course in order to do this efficient you need to understand what you're doing and, and how that impacts 
the the uh, the algorithm efficiency uh, and what the algorithms actually require is from the the underlying compute layer um, to achieve that that optimization um, going onwards to the horizontal integration so this is basically what we see and the challenges we see from from projects that where we are involved at the moment um, I mean the first one is that the specifications give some some room for interpretation uh, a little bit too much room for interpretation so so some of the some of the things do not work out of the box they has they have to be modified um, but of course then they, they they worked in another setting so so um, and then of course you can implement subsets of the overall specifications this, this is something that happens with all specifications, especially when they are done by a committee, because they then they tend to have options, and then you can select which options do you want to support, which may lead to interoperability issues, or it leads to interoperability issues that, that we see. You have the issue of versions and backward compatibility of, of newer versions of the specifications. Um, you see vendors being on different versions and sometimes it works and sometimes it don't um, also as a as an aspect of of disaggregation it means which is both a, a problem and a, and a and a benefit that you can specialize on on one part of of the architecture <clears throat> and become really good at that uh, but then of course ron needs when, when disaggregated, it consists of different components and they need to fit together and somebody needs to have the, the overall uh, uh, competence of, of putting, them, putting them together. Um, and then if we, we, see, we see frameworks and we're working with, with most of those frameworks uh, and reference architectures that are out there today. Uh, and they are not, they're not ready-made products. They need to be, um, kind of adapted, optimized, and, and adding features and, and things like that uh, to become products. Uh, so it's not like you download and, and use one of those, and then and then you have a, you have a product. Um, the last thing that I think is important is, is the expensive lab setup needed. And, and when, you, when you're integrating this, you, you need it for, for a continuous uh, for, uh, for a continuous time uh, across your your integration projects, and that's typically how vendors do it. They, they have a lab, and they are integrating, and they're they're doing CI/CD in the in the lab with as many iterations as as they can as they can master. Um, so so this these are some of the aspects of the horizontal integration. Um, so let's see what now. So going onwards and, and thinking a bit about the operational aspect, I think, uh, I mean, when I started in the business a long time ago, it was very much about performance of the network and still is, of course, uh, that, that we're focusing on throughput and, and those kind of things. And then, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, uh, we were more into trying to create services and, and value of that service. That, that was the way by which we compete. And I think we're now moving into a phase where operational costs become more important than, than they have been. Um, and that's interesting uh, as, as a way by which, by which um, operators can, can compete by, by actually producing essentially the same thing, but more efficiently. Uh, because that leads to that, that the operational systems and processes becomes purpose-built for each and every operator according to their organization and and the way they want to 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 operate it would be interesting to hear rudiger's comments on this later in the q a session uh, but but it to me it means that it will become harder to standardize those kind of things because they are essentially different um and and that uh, so we'd love a discussion on that um and and they are no longer offline batch systems they they become part of a control loop of of the system and and that's 
essentially more complicated and require more integration. Um, we, we can have an historical look about on, on this a bit. Uh, and I, I reflected, uh, this was a former colleague that just notified me about this, that a uh, long, long, long time ago, uh, the semantics of the system were carried by human beings, uh, sort of. And then you had the rotary dial, and okay, that's uh, the semantics of that were quite simple, but still we couldn't agree on a global level uh, on where the zero should be on the on the dial. Um, but the more we automate, uh, we basically transfer functionality to what we refer to as the control plane. Uh, which is automated. You can view it in, his, in an historical view as automated management. Um, but, but the key point is we need the semantics to be agreed. So we, we, need to, we need to define the meaning of everything, which is a bit contradictory to standardization or in, and innovation, or it's, it's, the, it's the standardization versus innovation issue. And when you bring that into the operational environment, um, this becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, so I will I will talk about that uh, towards the end. Um, so if we now think about the semantics and the automation that we want to achieve, looking forward uh, on from apps, X apps or R apps on the on the RIC platforms. They are essentially implementations of control loops. And it, so each and every app is a control loop. Uh, and, and when you have multiple control loops, you have the risk of, they, of them conflicting with each other, uh, independently of which layer they are on, uh, or between layers and, and within layers, and oscillation and, and those kind of things. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Audrey uh, deep diving a bit more into this area, uh, because to me that this basically means that um, these these apps needs to be integrated for every collection of them. So it's not about making sure that each each app works. It's about making sure that a certain collection of them works and, and achieves what, what we want to do without conflicts. Uh, and this is, of course, challenging uh, and there there is perhaps ways by which we can mitigate this uh, long term and, and find ways of, of dealing with it um, and now this this issue of innovation versus standardization um, so every everybody wants innovation so though that basically means we want new features uh, new features typically comes with configuration parameters or or operational views into these features. Uh, so that means that the operational view, we want it actually to be different uh, to a certain extent. Uh, we don't want difference on the things that are that are non differentiating, of course. Um, but but to me, it means that we will have a modify until it works paradigm. Uh, and uh, so it's just about how how do we deal with that? How do we make that more smooth? Um, and how do we make the components more easily integrated? Uh, and trying to wrap up a bit here, um, there is a, a good statement, I think, from Roy Amara uh, that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. I think all run is very, this is very applicable to Oron. Uh, everybody was kind of optimistic how, how quick this shift will go, and it's perhaps not going as as quick as we expected it uh, right now. Uh, but it will for sure have a uh, have a large effect in the long run, and this is because evolution is not linear. Actually, it's it's exponential. Uh, so. We can expect the, the, that it to happen a lot of, of interesting things in the coming years. And when we look back five to 10 years from now, uh, this will become clear probably. Um, so what, what did I talk about? Well, I talked about a bit about integration. Uh, I gave you an overview of open run integration, the different areas where that applies. We talked about the, the uh, uh, vertical integration and the flexibility performance trade-offs there. 
uh, the horizontal integration, frontal integration, most importantly. Uh, we talked about operational systems and, in, and the integration of those and why that is important for, for operators. Uh, and, and then wrapping up with innovation and uh, versus standardization. Uh, but then again, remember Amara's law. There is no silver bullet. Um, uh, it doesn't become easier it, it necessarily. Um, and we we have some 2,500 professionals with very relevant skills working in this area. And if you want to know more, there is a, a white paper on our website, uh, which kind of expands on all these topics and, and some of the other some of the things i haven't mentioned as well so by that um i'm i'm done and you're welcome to con contact me at any point and also acknowledgements to some of my colleagues uh for helping me out here thank you very much okay so thanks uh Mats, on uh the integration challenges and on your thoughts on this. I think we'll have questions on that uh, at the end. But now I'd like to switch after those two, uh, let's say, industry presentation more towards the um, academic view or more research view. Um, and now pass on to, to Adrian to speak about intelligent conflict mitigation. There are no architecture, so, uh, so, so we can easily recap everything. So uh, my point was that uh, it is intentional, really important to concentrate on these two elements, these two modules. So this X -sub subscription model and this conflict mitigation model. So this is really, of course, security and management is important and not a layer Sure, data layer is also very important, but uh, for now, the conflict mitigation is really somehow one of the critical issues that we have to solve nowadays. So uh, we finished here before this uh, this, this issue comes. Uh, so we have these X apps that reside uh, there in the open run network and, and environment environment. These have some specific functionalities, some sp some specific aims and goals, uh, and uh, simply will have different kind of conflicts. Just to mention that we may have some conflicts even here on the connection between near time near real time rig sorry and non real time rig. There could be some issues with, between these two uh, controllers, uh, but for now, I mean, there could be also some issues in accessing and modifying somehow the shared data layer. And I mean, what uh, I mean, so issues with aging of information saved there and so on, so on. Uh, but here, if we concentrate on some, let's say, basic stuff. Uh, some fundamental issues. So we will have some conflicts between the X apps and we have to somehow solve them. Uh, so let me provide uh, an example here, which is, it should be, I hope it should be a bit illustrative. So uh, there are two, you may say intentionally simple X apps and these are, I mean, very often uh, mentioned in the, in the many presentations that uh, we can find in the, in the internet. So there's the mobile handover, MHO and the traffic steering. Because the first one is responsible, of course, for handover. So when the user is moving, uh, I mean, from one cell to another cell, we need to hand over it. So, so it's uh, obvious. And then on the other side, we have this traffic steering. So uh, the goal of the traffic steering may be manifold, but one of, one of the goals is that uh, we have to, for example, offload some specific, uh, uh, so specific, uh, type of traffic to some other uh, type of base stations. So, I mean, to achieve some better performance metrics, one of the one of the issues. We can also uh, focusing on some load balancing and other stuff. So we can see immediately that these two are really, really, uh, really connected and there are mutual dependencies. Some of them could be it could be positive. So uh, as it is written written here, I mean, when the UE is approaching a cell border, MHR is initiated, of course, but it depends significantly on the applied traffic steering schemes. So then the final final handover will be done, I mean, following some guidance or some, some instructions from the traffic steering exam. Okay, good. And the opposite is, is the other one. Uh, if there is an uh, event which is triggered from, I mean, by the, by, I mean, the traffic steering exams that, that this particular UE have to be shifted from that particular cell to another, uh, some, uh, some the other, um, uh, other cell, then it initiate an over, of course. But also there could be some conflicts. Uh, so, uh, everyone probably intuitively uh, sees that uh, if there is an event, as I mentioned before, that the user is approaching cell border, MHR is initiated, but then there is traffic steering that, that uh, enters here into the game and say, no, no, you cannot do this because my policy is, uh, I mean, forbidding this. So we cannot do this handover because this type of traffic has to be uh, steered by, uh, by other, I mean, type of, uh, other type of uh, base station that you, MHR, are, uh, that you, MHR, are suggesting. 
<coughs> sorry. And also the opposite. Uh, so traffic steering may trigger something and I may choke, may revert it back. So we will have some people cafe. So these are very, I mean, straightforward issues. And uh, we can distinguish at least three types of conflict, of course, in that domain, because as I mentioned, there could be other conflicts in accessing shared data layer databases and, uh, and a conflict between the, the rigs themselves but here if you focus on the exams then you can say some we can see some direct conflicts some i mean i mentioned them just a while ago there may be also some indirect conflicts so it refers to the situation where uh, where uh, we address different parameters but then these parameters somehow influence something else so one example will modify one thing, the other will modify the other parameters. At the end, these parameters somehow reflects the same situation of the network, the same features of the network. And the, the worst case is with the implicit uh, situations, some long-term uh, behavior of the network. So we can imagine we have one X subs and the other X subs, and they are performing, the, 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 they are doing what they were exposed to do, expected to do. And then after some time, we see that there is some issues in the network that uh, on the one hand side, we see that uh, uh, when you try to apply, for example, for example, modify the, the transmit power, somehow we see some uh, some uh, some behavior of the network, and we have another exap which is uh, you know uh, trying to revert it back. So there could be some implicit conflicts, and. Uh, and uh, I mean, possible observations. So we now uh, open the, I mean, the the, the the box with some possible uh, solutions and some observations. So if we focus only on these conflicts between X apps, we may say that immediately we can apply some priorities, right? So uh, we can say that if there is an event, uh, then we propose a select set, uh, I mean, a fixed list of X apps that will be that will serve this particular event. So once the event is served, some called we can say a, 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 a sticky event, right? So then, if this event is served by this particular traffic, then this particular X up, then we can say, okay, this is done. We can forget about it. Uh, it has some drawbacks, of course. Then we may have some hierarchy. So. Uh, for example, traffic steering could be uh, executed first, and then we have some uh, information and some guidance from the MHO, and it overrides, always overrides the decision of traffic steering, or vice versa. It depends on the MNO policy. Uh, of course, there may be some something in between. We may have some dependencies, so MHO may be somehow triggered, even if the MHO is by one company and the traffic steering is by second company. Uh, so even then, we may imagine some mechanism that the traffic theory can influence the decision of the uh, of the uh, of MHO. And exactly as I see the in, in, in parallel, and I see some uh, some uh, some comments some by by Ikausi, for example. Yes, exactly. Some conflicts uh, conflicts is uh, is was considered uh, in fact in many cases, but son uh, is exactly. Exactly the the case. Some some self x functions or self healing self something functions. Of course, uh, we have similar problems. Uh, we can extend it, for example, also to cognitive radio. As you can imagine, there were I mean within the cognitive radio, one of the approaches is that we have to apply some policies. And if we apply, I mean, one policy, the other policy, these are implemented immediately. So then we have to con I mean guarantee some conformance of these policies. Operating systems they have to deal also with similar stuff. Interruption systems and microprocessors so we we have uh, foundations to, to work on it uh, so so these are at least four uh, domains from which we can we can be uh, we can get be inspired uh, so if we for example think also a bit on the uh, on the standardization issues then we can say okay we have this uh, it was proposed that we have the subscription management module so we can say that there could be also an event manager where we have a list of standardized events, so some triggers that can be observed in the network. So, for example, the new UE is entering. So, this type of message is uh, observed in the network. And these are, I mean, all of these events could be standardized. So, even if there will be hundreds of them, there will be a list of standardized events. And as now, the X subs can be subscribed to some specific parameters. We can say that this could be also subscribed to some specific events. So, on the right hand side on this slide, you can see that uh, the, the green X up is responsive. I mean, it will reply to the event of that color and I mean the blue one and the yellow one uh, and also the the orange one I mean it has this uh, this events and they and their scope and its scope sorry so then uh, in the event manager module we could have a list of subscriptions so connected X apps and uh, 
and we can see that if we apply, for example, the simple approach that we have this, uh, let's say, sticky list uh, of events, then if there is an event of the green color, then following based on this uh, based on these based on these priorities here uh, we may say that okay the, the, if the green even appears then the orange one will handle it if it will not handle then it will be passed to the yellow one or it can be done in parallel as well uh, of course we could create uh, also a list of conflicting uh, accepts from the past and then we can apply some some more fancy stuff so uh, this is the the simple approach how we can apply it so if the list are uh, of events is standardized and if we can say that this is fixed to some extent then we could have some dedicated modules uh, one of my phd is uh, is i mean has proposed uh, this uh, this algorithm he's investigating in detail how it can be done of course being inspired by the, this four domains as i mentioned in the past uh, so we have this conflict mitigation agent uh, the conflict mitigation and some agents without within that and uh, what we are what we are proposing is that we have these dedicated agents for this specific type of uh, of um, conflicts some direct indirect implicit and in the implicit we are considering application of some uh, some machine learning stuff to, to detect, to observe that if we apply this, what is happening, and then so on. Uh, we don't have more time, maybe some more technical issues, but I just wanted to point out that these are really, really uh, vibrant and uh, very interesting research uh, topics, and we have to somehow manage this. And also, from the, as I was mentioned in the past, and the previous presentation said that uh, from the academia, we have to somehow make it more uh, practical and uh, see all the limitations and constraints that uh, that appear in the in the real uh, network. Okay, so this is the first part, and now the second one, which is a bit shorter. So there is a need also on the automation process. Uh, so uh, I mean, this figure is quite simple. So we see on we can see three X apps which are delivered. It could be delivered to. X app store, we can call it a rig platform or say an X app store. So at the end, uh, the mobile, mobile network operator can download and purchase and I mean, simply get this uh, X app and install it in, in, its own, in its own network. But I mean, it uh, when we say it, it, I mean, as a concept, it's quite easy, but uh, probably we can say also, as we mentioned by Mars in the past, uh, that uh, I mean, human. Of course, will be there, but uh, it has to be automated. I don't believe that uh, uh, there will be human who will check everything and do everything one by one by clicking the mouse. It has to be an automated process. So, what what does it mean that this process of designing, testing, deployment? I mean, some policy changing and execution is automated. Uh, so uh, we may say that I mean. Uh, there are also maybe this is also important. There are also different risks because if we, if there are many many uh, exit providers then uh, i mean there could be the ones conflicts but then there could be some conformance issues then I mean we, we may think about some malicious behavior behavior so everything has to be detected and uh, tested automatically so there is a need in general for design automation testing automation deployment automation these are three phases how the ex how the exit can be your Arab, in fact, it can be uh, produced, manufactured, and then deployed and offered to the, man, to the mobile, uh, mobile network operator. Uh, so uh, when you look at this uh, and this figure, so this on the right side, uh, on the right side here, we have some extra providers. These are either uh, customized to some specific Greek platform, or these are more, let's say, generic. Uh, I mean, regardless if you are following the the top or the bottom uh, bottom level. Uh, we can see that there is an XAP provider uh, which is you know, or maybe uh, certified by some let's say trusted uh, trusted CAs and then uh, in order to make it automated we should uh, say that uh, it has to be uh, I mean there should be some sort of template uh, so so uh, the exap should be prepared in such a way that it could be easily, uh, from the perspective of the exap store, it should have to be easily tested, checked if this is really doing what it is uh, said to be done, uh, if it is really safe, and 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 what is the real behavior, if it really achieves such performance or or not. So in order to achieve this. Also, the exit provider should have some guidance, but also some limitations at the same time. So the the mm, the whole. Except should be prepared uh, as a, I mean, following some template-based approach. Then, if we have this template-based approach, this except could be delivered for 
testing and then we may check some integrity uh, issues we can check if there is conformance really uh, with the, within this uh, x app uh, what is the real performance we can verify security we can verify some uh, some conflict between between other x apps so for security uh, it's not only that the typical security that we can consider probably uh, in, in the nowadays systems but uh, x apps are assumed to apply also some um, machine learning tools i mean it is an in, inherent feature of uh, inherent feature of this uh, of this uh, application. So uh, there are dedicated security attacks on specific applied tools, uh, ML tools. So uh, these uh, security tests there include also testing on applied uh, machine learning uh, solutions. So assuming that all the tests have been done, uh, this could be placed in the in the XAP store. So again. I don't believe that it will be done one by one, click by click by a human, so it has to be automated. Uh, so the whole XAP should be prepared in such a way that it can allow automation. And then, uh, then of course, it can be downloaded or purchased by the MNO. And again, uh, when everything is non-disaggregated, if this is, let's say, a black box, then uh, we may say that uh, this black box offers some sort of trust in that sense that uh, we can assume that when the vendor is not delivering it, then it was tested by the vendor, okay. But here, we have, with the disaggregation and the opening of everything, then the, the issue is that uh, uh, MNO can also do some incremental improvements in the network, so it is probably impossible that uh, the MNO will that easily install new XAP. So there is a need for some automated deployment tests. So before the practical deployments, the MNO should deploy it, let's say, on the digital twin network, or what, however we'll call it, to, to, to check if really the, the application uh, XAP, which is, I mean, subject to potential uh, purchase, really is doing what uh, the MNO thinks it will do. So as we see, the, the whole step, the whole process is really complicated and uh, for sure it, uh, it, I mean, it has to be really automated. Uh, so uh, there are three levels of, uh, of automation process. Uh, this is quite detailed. Uh, there is a quite a detailed list of uh, items. I will not maybe go into into that now. Maybe for the uh, for the future, there will be a uh, request from the from the audience to discuss in the details. Uh, but these three levels, this has been, uh, I mean, in detail uh, analyzed as well. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I believe my time is is over now. Uh, so just to summarize these two stuff, two two things. I mean, there are many research uh, issues. Uh, I mean, now let's get it to open run. But these two, from my perspective, are very interesting. The first is, I mean, how to how to resolve different conflicts, different type of conflicts. As I mentioned, what I discussed are only conflicts between X apps, but there are many other types of conflicts, for example, within the rigs. Somehow you can imagine this. Uh, there are very similarities. So we have to get inspired by some good solutions and apply them and adjust them to the new scenario. But also there is a huge work, I mean, in front of us uh, towards the automation uh and uh, i mean on different levels of automation so uh, thank you for listening to me and also i'm happy to, to answer any questions that will appear in the q a thank you yep okay thanks so um thanks adrian for this uh discussion on config indication and now we are moving to the final um presentation from today simon from acceleron will speak about uh, open run for five for private networks and vertical industries Simon, the floor is yours. So, hi everyone. So, my name is Simon Pro. I represent a com company called Acceleron in, in Belgium, and I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Open RAN, but specifically uh, for private networks uh, in the in, or business to business types of networks. So, so some of the areas I'll touch upon are um, are just some of the aspects of the impact in the 5G architecture from Open RAN, specifically for business to business. Um, some of the enablers that ORAN bring and also some of the constrainers, things that are stopping deployments today in uh, in business to business 5G networks. And I'll also just touch on some of the, the things we've heard already about how the intelligence unleashes innovation into the RAN. Uh, so Acceleron, for those that don't don't know, uh, we make we're a vendor of open RAN um, 
products called DRAX. And as you see in the diagram below, the blue part, so we make neuro, um, neural time RIC, uh, CU parts, uh, and, and aspects of the of the um, the SMO, and we integrate with third party DURU vendors and integrate with with core providers to provide five G networks. Um, so so um, just to recap, when we've heard some of these things already on on Open RAN and ORAN. So so it's um, what o o ORAN has done is taken uh, uh, a lot of other uh, initiatives and, and things before from XRAN and ECPRI, ITU, IEEE, and has and has further disaggregated the RAN from from what 3GP has done, and has also brought in a lot of other uh, technologies. So so the impact is happening in a, in a number of areas. One is promoting this open, interoperable, multi-vendor solutions in the RAN, thereby stimulating innovation and competition. Um, one of the big aspects is, is bringing this intelligence into the RAN, and I'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, and this has spawned the whole of the open RAN movement with, with TIP and others being involved, the, the need for, for plug fest and interoperability. And so this momentum is growing day by day. Um, but one, um, but one thing you need to just to take into account is with five G networks, um, the the smartphones you have today, typically when they're running on public five G networks, uh, these are non standalone networks, and uh, so it's five G bolted on top of a four G network. Um, but the uh, what is starting to happen, and certainly for business to business applications, these full five G standalone networks with a, a pure 5G core and a, and a 5G RAN GMBs being disaggregated. Um, this is the, the new wave of 5G that is coming. And here, the, the applications of these 5G networks will not just be for, for public mobile networks. A lot of them will be for, for business to business, non-public networks as, there's, as they're called. Um, so, so an open round will play into this into this market in a big way. I mean, so we see the first deployments, the big deployments of of greenfield public networks like for Rakuten and Dish. Um, those will certainly happen, but it's a lot of the the public networks for um, for in enterprises and, and industry, and and this is where a lot of the the impact of. Uh, of open RAN will really come. Um, so it's it's these this new market which will change the uh, the value chain. We heard about this on the supply chain, the value chain, but the the economies because the customers are no longer people with smartphones and public mobile network operators, but it is a new ecosystem of service providers and infrastructure owners and vertical applications. Uh, and and in doing so, open RAN will. Um, will add a lot of economic benefits to to industries and um, as they digitize as they add the 5g connectivity for their types of of applications um, and, and there is a growing investment so so oran is really starting to take off now like i say most of it is in these new 5g standalone networks and that's where a lot of the growth will come from um, and you see big in investments throughout the world, for instance, in the U.S. with the, uh, the Chip and Science Act, so a lot of $1.5 billion being invested into diversifying the supply chain and in innovation. And that's where, uh, that's where, for us, a lot of the interest is in. So it's beyond just the public mobile networks into in what you can term, if you like, B2B 5G networks, non-public networks. So some of them are... Are, are purely private networks. So other ones are, are a bit more complicated and hybrid. Um, and, and, and often when you move into private networks, um, it, the spectrum, is, which is one part, will dictate the, the architectures. Because in some cases, if, you, if you're looking to deploy a private network for a factory, they want everything on premises. They will, for security, they won't allow anything any traffic or data to, to leave or enter the factory. Um, and, and this is what is termed a standalone non-public network. And an open round is, will, will start to be having a, a very important um, value into this sector. For, but, but there are other types of, of deploying networks as well. Um, as well in non-public networks, you can have the, 
the public government you know, offering services what they what they call PNI MPN, uh, and there's a new ecosystem of of, of neutral host providers. Um, that a lot of the uh, the infrastructure has been divested by by the public network operators. So there's a rise of of tel- uh, tower codes and other types of infrastructure owners that are looking to offer services to to vertical applications, uh, 5G, business-to-business type applications, uh, using spectrum sharing, uh, both Mocken and Moron types of of sharing. And and indeed, the the, the hyperscalers are starting to offer private 5G networks. You can, uh, uh, AWS have a private 5G and, and Google has this distributed ed- edge cloud. So, so, so some of the things become uh, more complex than just a 5G network as we understand it. And, and a lot of the, the capabilities to add an edge data network for, for reduced latency or for security or, um, or for those sorts of applications is something that we see um, a, lot of, a lot of interest uh, coming, but it also has constraints. Um, because today the, the spectrum actually drives a lot of deployments. If if you don't have spectrum, you don't have a network. Uh, and the the public the public mobile network operators today, of course, have spent lots of money licensing uh, spectrum through these auctions, these licensed spectrum. Um, unlicensed spectrum we're all using with Wi-Fi, and there's of course the interest on on using that in 4G and 5G networks as well. But it's this area of shared spectrum that will unlock the the growth of business-to-business 5G applications and these markets of of open RAM for for private networks. Um, And it varies by country. I mean, US, you have CBRS that is is making headways. In Europe, some countries have been leading... um, in the mid, typically in the mid-range spectrums, and other countries now are following. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, a lot of these, these private networks, as you can see in the bottom left, the countries that, that provide this spectrum for shared access, of course, these are the places where the first business-to-business uh, private-type networks get deployed. And, and gradually... Um, uh, this is being replicated in many countries. So, so there's there's this conflict between short term uh, revenue gained by auctioning every possible megahertz of spectrum possible, uh, compared against the economic costs. Because um, by enabling shared spectrum, enabling open RAN and private networks, there's a lot of economic benefits. So countries that 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 um, that foresee shared spectrum. In the end, will benefit a lot more. Uh, they may lose short-term spectrum revenue, but there's a, a lot of a lot of economic benefit to be gained by by deploying networks. But it does vary by region. So I showed just ITU region one here, um, uh, uh, but uh, and you see even within sort of Europe, it varies country by country which frequencies are allocated in N78 band or N77 upper. So it becomes a complex spectrum, but this is this is an important way because it's only through spectrum that the big deployments of these second generation uh, 5G standalone networks come. And indeed, this, this will enable the, the continued growth of 5G networks as we start moving towards 5G advanced and, the, and even towards 6G. So it's a, it's a very important aspect that is sometimes overlooked and specifically for, for business-to-business applications. Um, there, there's another constraint. Um, you, you hear lots about, of course, smartphones that, that support 5G. I have one and I'm sure many of you do. But when the 5G thing comes up, as I mentioned, it is non-standalone. And today the... Uh, the phones uh, and the underlying chipsets like called the Qualcomm Snapdragon and things, these are focused on, on volume. So, so they're focused on business, uh, business to consumer smartphones. But when you go to private networks, the current generation of user equipment that is around just don't just typically don't work for a lot of features that are de- developed. So, so I think sometimes people get a bit carried away looking at three GPP release 15, 16 features, 17, 18 features. Um, but just to give a couple of examples, um, in one of the 
Uh, one of the things that started in release 15 and, is, and it's been extended in release 16 is support for, for what are called Ethernet PDU sessions. So, so typically in business applications, in, instead of just getting IP connectivity, they want Ethernet uh, layer two Ethernet connectivity because many industrial protocols like Profinet and other things work uh, out layer two. Uh, Ethernet layers and VLAN layers. Uh, and this is the same, not only in 5G, but it's the same sort of the things you see in, in satellite access for business and, and many other types of access, whether it's uh, MPLS or something where you have the layer two access compared to layer three access. But, but these, the user equipment today, um, and that is changing with the with the new generation of Relix, really 16. But these things just don't work. So so all this TSN LAN bridging and native support support for for being able to distribute uh, timing over the LAN and, and very low delay. These things are just not supported by the generation of today. So so the the constraints on private networks and constraints on on open RAN private networks are constrained by UE. Uh, UE. So. Another example is in millimeter wave. Uh, we hear you hear a lot about trials using uh, using millimeter wave, um, but this is typically today using carrier aggregation. So you have a you have a sort of a lower frequency anchor, and you aggregate millimeter wave spectrum or frequency range two spectrum if you prefer. Um, but if you're running a private network pro purely on a millimeter wave, most um, I, I don't know of any in a moment UE chipsets that support millimeter wave only um, standalone operation. And there are some, some countries that have allocated um, uh, shared spectrum only in frequency range two, only in millimeter wave and not in, in mid range frequency. So, so that's another example, um, positioning. We hear a lot about 5G native um, location services as they're called positioning services where you have features like this um, downlink and uplink angle of arrival, and time difference of arrival. Um, but a, a lot of these things um, don't, uh, are not currently supported on the, on today's generation as user equipment. So, so there's a big lag between, um, uh, between the 3GPP and, and ORAN specifications and, and the actual availability of, of CPEs and, and devices that support all these types of features. Uh, the features are very much driven, as I said, by volume and not uh, whereas the, the, the volume for, for industrial applications are still to come. Uh, and of course, for industrial networks, private networks, all the IoT story is very important as well. Um, but the MBIOT and LTM are, are just on 4G at the moment, LTE. So, so having a pure 5G, um, new radio, 5G standalone network uh, means you, you don't have native support of an MBIOT or LTM. Uh, and even in release 17, where the, the NR light or reduced um, capacity, it, that's focusing more on the high-end IoT devices with video and not the very, very low um, bandwidth connectivity of MBIoT devices. So, so there are there are today there are limits when it comes to to practical applications for private networks. Um, an, another issue today, and, and it's a, is a, an interesting and a very important one, is is also the front hall. Um, now, as you, you probably know, as you start disaggregating the CU and DU and RU, uh, between the DU and the RU, you have the front hall. And there's the specific, specifications from, from ORAN, uh, which has now been, in, in Europe, has now been ratified by Etsy. Uh, and they split, they, um, they split, in 7.2 split, they have using typically a CPRI over the top, and also using the synchronization, so the time and frequency synchronization distributed over this front hall with, with P2P, V2, and SYNCHE. Uh, but it's, it's a scenario that is moving, and certainly when we start, start looking towards millimeter wave as well, because the, um, the bandwidth uh, requirements quickly grow. And if you start moving towards um, higher, higher order uh, MIMO, and start moving towards 400 megahertz carriers of millimeter wave, then 
then very quickly the the um, the, the throughput requirements of the front hall exceed the optical technologies. So today, today's technologies for, for a front hall is normally within shorter distances, um, 10 gigabit per second using uh, these FFP plus transceivers plugged in for point to point dark fiber links. Um, but quickly you start exceeding those sort of bandwidths if you're not careful. Uh, you start having to use core technologies that it's just become prohibitively expensive um, for, for front hall for, for private networks. And, and again, the, the, the compute power needed in, in DU, um, in software only DUs, we heard about it in one of, um, in one of our previous presentations that uh, the need for hardware acceleration and things rather than, than pure software um, driven DUs becomes very important. So this is, this is something that is, um, that is sort of being understood and is being addressed and, 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 is certainly working, uh, but these things are also very jitter sensitive. So, so having TSN switches and how you how you um, engineer the front hall is very critical due to the not only the bandwidth requirements but also the delay and in many cases the jitter, which it becomes very critical on, on ensuring that this front hall stays within the uh, the required timing specifications. So. As I mentioned, one of the, the things that I think this is something that's going to grow as we start moving towards 6G is the addition of the RIC. We've heard about it in other presentation, the, the addition of intelligence in Iran. Now, um, this extensibility of how through X apps and R apps, we can, can add in the intelligence for, for functionality like radio resource management, uh, interference management, um, Zero touch automation, certainly as you start moving towards private networks. Um, if you have a small private network, the, the factory has only got a couple of IT guys and doesn't have traffic engineers or telco engineers. So, so all these systems have to be more and more automated. You have to plug them in and they have to auto negotiate, auto discover, auto tune the, the networks. Um, so the, the, the intelligence to do this sort of thing is very important. Um, as is things like the traffic steering and, and mobility management uh, is becomes very important. And, and certainly as we start moving towards 5G advanced, um, where the, the beam forming, where sort of uh, massive MIMO and beam forming start coming into the picture for certain certain cases, uh, then, then this is very important. And, and this addition of the intelligence into into the run will become even more important. Uh, so this is this is actually an area that is this a very big discussion point. It was mentioned about the, the the next generation run. How you add the intelligence as you start moving towards six G is a is a very open question and a very interesting research topic in a moment because um, today in in Oran you have the RIC. And then you typically have E2 interface that um, that has to be extended each time you want to to add in new functionality, and it misses some types of functionality compared to to 3GPP that um, that are possibly looking at bringing the the service based architecture of the control plane down into the RAN, and then the intelligence would be added more as an application function. The same way it is in the in the five G core control plane today, so we will see, we will certainly see how that evolves. Because and I saw one of the com uh, the comments mentioned, yeah, and six G also uh, native intelligence for for the waveforms in in, in six G and, uh, and and intelligence deeper into the RAN into the DU and uh, uh, is and, and for cell free networks that are being looked at at six three six G. It's certainly um, it certainly the, will be a key enabler in intelligence, but how it is done in 6G, I think, is still uh, is still a very interesting research topic. Uh, so just to give you a view of, of what we're doing, I mean, I, I'm involved very, very much into the research aspect. And, and in Europe, we have a program of Horizon Europe. And there's a, there's a new um, program a sub-program Horizon Europe called Smart Networks and Services. And, and, and early next year, we'll be kicking off a new, um, a new project a, um, dedicated to the, to the energy 
saving in the in the open run type of architecture. Um, as as it was mentioned before, it's a very hot topic. Um, the battery lifetime in devices has been important for energy saving, but energy saving in the network itself, specifically in the RAN, is something that uh, that we'll be focusing on. And using intelligence to save energy is is one will be one key part of that. Um, using the RIC, um, both in the near real time RIC. So, for instance, looking at um, uh, looking at switching off some radios when they're not needed at quiet times. For instance, if a factory only works during the day but not at night, you can scale down some radios. Um, you can go from from high order MIMO down to lower order MIMO, or even or even SISO. So, so the energy cost of of running a network is becoming is becoming more and more important as as energy comes up and things like the green deal and 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 5G 5G moving to to higher order mimos um, will will increase that growth so so that's an area of of using the intelligence using the rick to manage the uh, to manage the the power consumption in in um, in the ran is something that that we're doing and it's still research and it's something that will will come in into 5G advanced and will become sort of built in into 6G as far as I see it. Uh, and another area where the intelligence is coming in and, and, and Remedo, so the chairman of and the speakers in, in this presentation, have also got some interesting things on the, uh, the massive MIME use cases for the different types of beam forming, which I won't go, won't get into it at this point, but the, the, the use of, um, the use of the RIC and the intelligence to to manage these sorts of beam forming scenarios is is very interesting. And this again, this is something that will come into five G advanced even more um, into sort of release eighteen onwards. Um, so this is these are very um, very uh, in very important and very interesting sort of developments that are being enabled in ORAN as we start moving towards six G. Um, Another thing looking just slightly further ahead and is another project we're involved in in Europe called Marsal. And, and one of the research topics for 6G is moving away from, from a, a, a cell-based network, a cellular network, to something called user-centric cell-free. So the, where the borders between the cells become um, non-observable to the user equipment. So as people are roaming, they can they can have... Uh, transmission, both downlink and uplink, from multiple access points coming to to the users. Um, but it, it, that in itself, the research we've done is, is showing that there's a lot of implications on, on doing that. There's a lot of additional development on, on DUs needing to to cooperate with with each other to to manage the different types of RUs in and re dynamically changing the clusters of access points or radios as as their users are, are moving within this cell free uh, cluster and again the RIC um, is an important part the intelligence in the RIC is an important part of of managing and and, uh, and adapting the clusters due to the to the changing load and changing user patterns and mobility into this run. So, so those are the, some of the, the areas we've been covering, um, as I mentioned. So these are a couple, couple of projects we're researching on, and there are a lot of other research going on in Europe and, and, and wider on, um, uh, on this field of, of, of open RAN today and, and open RAN moving in 5G advanced to, towards 5G, uh, towards 6G. Okay, so thank you. Thanks for that. And then uh, we'll go to the discussion. I have uh, four very difficult questions to each of you. And of course, um, they are targeted to, to one, uh, but then others can complement. So I have the first question is to Rudiger because he's been silent for, for a while now. So um, recently there is a big focus within Oran Alliance, uh, which comes from the operators mostly on energy efficiency that Simon touched upon a, a bit and related energy saving features within Oran. Uh, what are the most important aspects here and how do you think that will evolve uh, towards 6G? Oh, that's a difficult question. So um, to be honest, um, <clears throat> I think we need to... to um, so uh, we learned a lot uh, today as well about the complexity if we disaggregate uh, things. And um, 
and it will not um, come to a point where we'll network and, and the, the stuff will be um, more simple and more easier. But, but what we, what I can say with regards to lessons learned, uh, even uh, if we look uh, to other disaggregation projects that we run uh, within the company, it's <clears throat> quite often that we start um, in the beginning designing a new system um, with uh, so-called feature parity. So means everything that we have from the legacy stuff will be transferred into the new new things. So this will be not not uh, work efficient to be honest, and lead not to to any savings with regards to energy. So what we need to do is um, focusing more on on customer uh, needs here. Uh, looking really what the customer wants, not only transferring uh, something from the old world into a new world, uh, this will not, not, not work anymore. So means reductions of features and going as well new ideas. So uh, if, for example, cooling is 50% of the energy costs that we spend uh, today, right? Uh, then, then we need to, to um, think as well about new approaches, how to cool the equipment um, and go uh, really as well disruptive ways. So that's completely technology independent uh, in the first case, right? Um, um, but but this kind of things are needed to to come down with, with energy consumptions and more efficiency. But as well, um, we, we are talking about uh, the X apps and, and this kind of uh, ways to, to manage and to uh, reduce load uh, by, uh, to the network. So as well, this kind of things, AI and data analytics is, is needed uh, in future to, to save energy in the networks. Okay, thanks. Anybody want to complement that? Okay, then I have another one now for Adrian. Um, speaking about research um, and the TOA 60, so do you think that OpenRun is going its own path independently on 6G and can it succeed without uh, being part of 6G? Also, also very, uh, very interesting question. I was saying also very <laughs> vivid because uh, you know, 6G, uh, 6G as, uh, as, a, as a solution for the future is also very often uh, considered as really as a solution to all the converged networks that it will cover many many applications so in that sense uh, if really it will happen uh, so then there is no other way without uh, without 6g so it has to be part of it but on the other side uh, if we concentrate on the if we concentrate on for example wi-fi or let's say uh, other uh, other domain here we see there it's my point of view that also there are some activities on the open wi-fi uh, so uh, there's a trend in general so uh, to me I, I i see it i mean at least twofold uh, first is really the trend as we observed in the past for the operating systems uh, where we have the trend with the open uh, open system and linux and all of the stuff here we are observing uh, something similar so there's a really a trend in different aspects in different areas of forest communications in general uh, that everything is going into virtualized and open part and of course uh, in that sense it could be uh, in, the, in that sense it will be a separate track but uh, on the other hand we may say that uh, 6g will be highly influenced by by this activity so we can even see now and in, in different uh, let's say vision documents what i mean we see a lot of words like programmability openness and so on and so on so uh, even if not directly then uh, for sure the impact in my my opinion the impact will be very very high okay thanks uh, simon i want to complement this Uh, yeah, I just I just agree with what they said, really. Uh. Okay. Um, all right. So, Matt, uh, as you've been speaking about one of the challenge in Open Run, I think for now it's, it's the biggest one actually. So, so what uh, beyond that or a part of that are major challenges for Open Run uh, to take off on a mass scale uh, that is happening right now? Yeah, I think. 
I mean, energy efficiency is probably one of them, or, or we can say performance in general, then uh, to some degree. But, uh, but I guess um, th then I think it's it's also one thing that we seldom talk about is we, we tend to talk about mobile networks as something separate, and then you have the rest of the world kind of using them. Uh, and and I think that when we start to see that this is a way by which we can integrate 5G into all kinds of solutions, industry automation solutions with, with 5G inside, sort of, or or whatever, then then we would then we would get kind of on the next level of, of innovation, I think. And 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 that would be interesting to see what, what happens then. Whether it's then whether we have uh, arrived at number six then or, or that I don't know, but but at some point, kind of this being more democratized, you could say, uh, as a technology. Okay. Anything, anything else from anybody else? Russell, maybe you have a comment here as well. Uh, I've got questions for each of them that I could consume hours individually so <laughs> okay. I, I hope that maybe in the future i'll have that chance but there was there was so much meat and material here that i would really love to dig in with each one of them individually okay good okay so then i have final one for uh, simon um what wh where are we in the oran deployments real life because you've been uh, selling those and um, doing uh, a lot of proof of concepts and uh, where do you expect the, the market to be in the Oran deployment soon? Because yeah, there is a lot of like um, a lot of um, V runs or open V runs or almost V runs or open run without the dash and with the dash. And it's a lot of mix and match uh, currently. Yes. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you have the sort of the, the well publicized um, deployments like Rakuten and Dish and things. Um, and then you, as you mentioned, you have you have lots and lots of, of test beds, both sort of lab scale test beds, but also outdoor sort of living lab type um, type deployments and things as well. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of deployments you don't hear about, I think, because when um, when we're beyond the, the public networks, a lot of private networks, and a lot of deployments such uh, for for industrial applications are, are testing are testing things out i mean at a staging level sometime checking you know getting trying to get deployed uh, ready to go live and so so in a lot of cases um uh the you you don't hear about all the deployments but i think most of the operators have their have their have their test deployments some of them are rolling out you're hearing like from avenir and others that they increasingly they they are rolling out things um you're hearing things from um a bit strangely, sometime that Nokia start talking about is open RAN private deployments. Um, whether that's open RAN or not, you, of course you can, you can, you know, that's open for discussion maybe. But um, yeah, so there are a lot, and, and some of the late, latest studies are, or reports I've seen is that they are now starting to exceed expectations. So, so there are there are these challenges, like, like I mentioned. I mean. There are those challenges to deployments, the, the equipment side, the, the technical side, you know, the, the hardware acceleration and the front hall and those things are, are, are being solved and are increasingly being solved and the, the energy will be managed for those. There's those, the, the other challenges are, I think, the, some of the things I mentioned on, on with spectrum availability to roll out in some countries, they're, they're um, the ones as soon as the spectrums there are a lot will will be rolled out much quicker than they are in some countries so so in europe you're seeing the uk and germany leading and france is following now and things as well and, and that is starting to to evolve and change uh, and um there's but there's also um you know the challenges on on the uh, the integration side, not system integrator, but ran integrator and stuff as well. So so a lot of those deployments are there and people testing them. But I think a lot of people are are not talk necessarily talking about the, the deployments they have out there. Um, but for the actual numbers, I think I'd just point you to the latest reports uh, that there are there were some come out recently. I can't remember the figures, but uh, some recently on on the number of deployments that there are. Okay, thanks. So that would be it from my side. And thanks again for uh, 
for the discussion and for all the all, all the presentations now. Um, and I will hand back to Russell for some Q and A from uh, the audience because I have seen there were some questions. Yes, there were. Thanks, Marcina. I, I did see also that uh, Rudiger and um, uh, Adrian have been actively uh, addressing, answering some of those questions already. So thanks for that. Um, I think one from uh, Carlos Sal Perez. I, I believe this is for uh, my notes here. It says it's for um, for Rudiger. Was uh, Oran is using virtualization in generic hardware cots, essentially, right? Uh, commercial off the shelf. Uh, servers. Um, when do you see that OpenRAN could be used in a in a in a cloudified environment? So I think I think basically is when will OpenRAN be cloud native? I think you're and I think we. You may have to refresh your browser if you're not. No, muted. I have to switch on the mic. So so I, uh, okay. sorry for that. So I think parts of of of, um, of uh, what we what we see in in labs in trials is is already cloud ready, right? And it depends yeah. a bit um, uh, on the use cases uh, as well on the traffic if you need accelerators or not. Um, basically, uh, you, you you can run uh, some workloads for sure uh, as well in the cloud and um, uh, in in a cloud native manner. That's uh, as well the goal, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. A good question from uh, Carlos All. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Soheb Sol. I'm. Pardon me. I'm not going to pronounce your name very well. But he's asking about the energy efficiency of ORAN equipment versus traditional RAN equipment. Um, I think that Rudy, that might also be another question for you. Um, maybe for all, uh, but uh, I, I can try to. So that's a question not easily to answer, right? Uh, because it depends a bit how you optimize um, um, your network in, in which direction. So and and energy efficiency is is really a hard uh, um, a goal uh, to to achieve um, uh, if you maybe want to optimize bandwidth uh, um, 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 capabilities and this kind of thing. So so there are sometimes um, objectives are working against each other. So that depends a bit um, how to optimize your network. Even yeah. if it's a, a closed uh, single box solution and um, uh, or an, an um, open uh, disaggregated approach, but um, maybe some some of the colleagues here can can say a few words. Uh, I, I, I can add on, yeah, I can add on on that. Um, I think I think it's. I mean, we we typically normally have been traditionally comparing properties under maximum load. So we talk about full buffer use cases. How many megabits per second? Can I push through a, a certain product? And then we might measure uh, how much energy does it consume when doing that under some conditions. I mean, that's far from real conditions. I think that's what you're on to, Rudiger, a bit, right? So if th there are research projects showing how much of the traffic is carried by which of the base stations in the network. And, and it's surprisingly few that carries a lot of traffic. And the rest of them is kind of half idling. If, if you wish. Um, mm. so, so they are running on completely different uh, operational points. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, over the course of the day, or, or traffic varies. So I think we need to start to compare under dynamic conditions, because that is more, real, more realistic conditions. Uh, and then we come into we, we can call it cloud native, but in R, RF native, maybe, or, or how does how does the solution scale and, and adopt? Uh, and, and I think that those are the kind of features or characteristics that, that needs to be more important, both in, in traditional solutions as well as in open world solutions, because I don't think any of those are particularly good today in, in being being dynamic. I think the question is a little bit like the question of is ORAN cheaper than the traditional solutions because you know no vendor, no proprietary vendor ever gave you a price for a base station. 
Yeah. So how do you compare the price of uh, an O-RAN solution versus the price of a traditional? There's there's cert there's just no eggs, you know, apples to apples comparison. It, when you buy a network, you know, you buy 10,000 base stations and a bunch of RNCs and, a, and, you know, the whole the whole as they say, the whole kit and caboodle. How do you determine the price of a single base station? So same in the regard of power. Right. Has anyone ever seen where a vendor, a proprietary vendor has said, hey, our base station consumes X amount of you know watts per hour or whatever, and to to Mott's point is what are the what's the metrics? What's the what's the you know the unit or standardized metric that would you know is it is it throughput per per watt you know or is it you know time of day sensitive? I'm not even sure people have started to look at that yet. Certainly, it's a research topic where you know the amount of power the network is consuming is of interest to people. You know we're trying to get greener, um, but I think that that's mostly that's information to still lies in our future. Uh, we are at time. Um, if you gentlemen wish to keep discussing this, I'm, I'm happy to go forward and we can leave it to the audience to stay or drop off as their own schedules permit. Yeah. Um, there was uh, another question from uh, Srinivas Velmuri um, uh, about uh, the ORAN RIC architecture and uh, the energy efficiency. H how do they differentiate themselves? Um, again, this is kind of the same discussion where, um, you know, we can compare you know, a, a, a version of an o, uh, of ORAN, what it consumed, the power it consumed versus an optimized version of that. We can compare the past of ORAN versus a current or future ORAN. But again, it's very hard to compare ORAN with the traditional vendors. Anybody want to jump into that? Yeah, just on because I mean, the traditional vendors and what we're saying with the, switching the radios off from, you know, 2G onwards, that was based on, on sort of macro, outdoor macro cells for, for consumers because it, it does depend very much on the workload so the the need say in a factory of of optimizing for smaller numbers of users and very different sort of workloads based on during the day or in the evening or at night or something depending on the shifts they're running and the equipment and, and so i think the i think probably the the key benefit for the uh, energy optimization is the is the dynamic of, uh, adaptability of the rounds mm. you know of being able to use apps to say to move to move uh, users uh, proactively from one cell to another then switch off cells uh, still you know reducing maximum throughput down to a minimum level of throughput acceptable in low low conditions so so as you say and that's again very different than if you're in a football stadium where there's a game going on and when there's not a game going on how you sure. adapt to those sorts of things yeah? so so it is way because around is going to be used for de different types of indoor outdoor applications and workloads i think it's that that again becomes of course harder to compare it against maybe more generalized uh, macro cell architectures that use a certain power and have certain types of features but of course the, those the incumbent vendors are, are adapting to private networks and having products fitting more towards indoor networks as well so so it's a, a moving target and it's it is certainly hard to quantify yeah I would maybe, add, if I may, just want to comment from the research perspective. So uh, I would say that uh, the energy efficiency in telecom is with us for, let's say, many years, I would say. So first, very, very big projects were dated 2010 or even earlier. Uh, I mean, very, very big international projects. So, uh, so energy efficiency in general uh, in these rather forms is with us for I mean, quite a long time. But uh, now it is, uh, I mean, there is a fresh view because with the open run, we, I can say from the research perspective, we gained some new ways to address this problem. So previously it was left mainly to some, I mean, vendors, how to deal with this. And then uh, for even from, from the research perspective, we could uh, think about some specific algorithm that will do this or that only focusing on energy efficiency, which normally was left to uh, big vendors. So now I would say that there are some new doors open and maybe we can gain by, I mean, entering them. Yeah, it's a it's a topic that I think we'll we'll be spending a lot more time on in the future, just because there's so many base stations now versus even sure. 2010. You know, there's there's maybe five or ten x the number of base stations now than there were mm -hmm. even you know 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, 
even though they're smaller, you know, small cells, they're still all consuming lots of power and the, the price of power has gone up and there's a much greater awareness and focus on, you know, energy efficiency and they're, you know, killing the planet. So um, I think we'll be learning a lot more about this going of course, forward. Of course. Um, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, but just to point out, it's not only Oran looking at this as well, 3TP themselves, sure. there's a couple of studies yes, exactly, exactly. that are focusing on energy efficiency and then these sort of low power waking, waking up sleeping cells and things like that as well. So so there's a lot of industry-wide uh, focus on this at 3GP, uh, ORAN and everywhere. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a hot topic and a very important topic over the next years towards 6G. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was my message, in fact. So the open run is, I mean, simply offering some specific features how to address it. Mm. Um. That's the end of the questions in the chat session that I was able to see. Um, but I, if I can, if you wouldn't mind, I wanted to ask um, of, of uh, Mats, when you're, you know, I think the holy grail of open RAN really for the industry is you can, you know, as an operator, you can mix and match. You pick this RU and, and you know, this vendor's CU and this vendor's DU and put them all together with some other vendor's RIC and run your network. Um, which is the complete opposite of what we have today is where, you know, the entire network has a blue logo and that's it. You know, it's, it's either 100% uh, homogeneous or, you know, in the Holy grail, it's heterogeneous completely. Isn't there a practical reality that somewhere probably a lot closer to the homogeneous network than to that heterogeneous Nirvana where, you know, maybe in this part of the network, I can, I can put up a Rick and now I can run this vendor's CU, DU and RU. Right. But it's just, you know, it's a it's a cluster. It's a handful of base stations. I don't have to, you know, I'm, what's the likelihood that any operator is going to mix and mass, even given if we had interoperability that was, you know, you know, perfectly uh, effective. What's the what's the odds that an operator is going to mix and match to that level? Right? Isn't it much more likely that an operator would pick and say, OK, this base station is going to be all Mavenir stuff and this station is going to be all JMA wireless or something like that. This station over here is PW. Right. What, just what's the practical aspect of this from an, an operator's perspective? Well, was that a question to me or the root girl? <laughs> I, I was I can kind comment of, on it. But, <laughs> well, it's both because he's the operator. It's true. Yeah, I was exactly. kind of thinking I mean, of it as I'm, an integrator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to confront this as a problem, and I'm yeah, just not sure. No, but I think I think coming back to the point of that the, uh, I mean, if you look at the real network with tens of thousands of base stations, they they operate at very different conditions, yeah. meaning you don't need a Ferrari in all sites uh, to start with. So so you you could, that's kind of a a driver for perhaps mix and match differently in different parts of, of the overall network. And then most operators, I mean, Deutsche Telekom in Germany, if I remember correctly, operate in four regions. Uh, you, you select vendors per region, or used to do. Used to um, do yeah. Uh, and and there is overlay, so you have 2G, 3G, 4G. Uh, you have different vendors for that. So that means that in a certain city, you, you already now have multiple vendors. Uh, in in overlay networks, we have we have small cells, pico base stations, and indoor solutions and stuff. So so there is already a, a vendor mix in most operator networks. Um, it's it's though it's not as as granular as parts of cells, <laughs> though no, no, because of course that that makes it more difficult. But um, I think there is reasons for having different configurations, you may call them, in different parts of the network. Whether those come from the same company or whether you end up uh, for cost savings or, or other reasons, just to have to have the certain characteristics you, you want uh, in a particular... I mean, Simon, you talked about stadiums, for example, which is a very specific deployment case. Uh, and likely your your high-end urban uh, base stations don't fit very well into a stadium. So that's, that's a good example of something that requires very specific solutions. 
Yeah, I think I mean that's certainly where where Tip has been playing an important role, together with Oran on these interoperability centres and um, certification and, and plug fests and things like that of having <laughs> sets of equipment known to work together and things. I think that will because because it is a bit a challenge the Oran integration. So and it's going to scare off you know a lot of people that don't have those competences. So so I think. These uh, this certification of knowing that this certain set of, of equipment from these vendors works together, you'll end up, as I mentioned, probably with sets, as well as the, the big ones you buy from Mavenir, just like you buy from Nokia or Ericsson. Um, these configurations of known things that known uh, that no uh, work have been proven to work together and proven to be an operate interoperable will probably start having these sort of blueprints or or presets of configurations and i think that's that's probably the role of the system integrator that they will be able to promote known sets of of configuration that are validated to work and things like that and i think that that role of the system integrator in providing that to the to the smaller operators and to the private network owners uh, I think is is a key aspect of 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 that side of the challenge. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, Simon. I think you know uh, reference architectures. That's a that's a, a value add that the systems integrator might provide. Is you know we have these three or four reference architectures, uh, you know that might need to be slightly customized, you know, on a per site basis. But starting with those reference architectures would simplify the overall network deployment. Yeah, the, the, the interesting part the interesting part here is as well um, um, having an option uh, even after ramping up uh, with a certain ecosystem to swap components right uh, so so that that you really have that option um, that we don't have today with the with the current setups uh, uh, in the network so after ramping in in Germany up or um, in a certain country, it's quite difficult to, to swap um, later on. And uh, with that kind of uh, open run architecture, we are, we are able. So even if we only start, for example, with, I don't know, a handful of, of different um, uh, participants in that ecosystem. The other thing is creating, and this is really a nice topic we stressed not, not a lot today, creating a platform ecosystem on top of such kind of thing uh, like an uh, uh, as an uh, near real time rig or the rig so coming in with different um, uh, providers um, of different types of x apps here and allowing a, a competition on on that area as well so um, that is a, a topic um, that makes the oran architecture as well quite interesting <clears throat> yeah um thanks for that I, I i you're right we didn't talk about that enough okay marcin anything else from you nope i think we can we are good to wrap up thanks a lot for joining us appreciate your support and i uh, look forward to seeing you again with the next one yeah, thank thanks you. everybody bye-bye thank bye-bye